What is up my friends and how's it going? Welcome back to another video with your fellow comrade Summary. For those of you who have subscribed to my YouTube channel, you will know that recently I conducted a community poll in which I included my community to determine the future direction of this channel. Basically there were two options, one which maintained the status quo in which I release two episodes for our Let's Play series weekly and the second option was to diversify, tone back a little on our Let's Play series but diversify my content by releasing guides, live streams and so forth. And of course the second option which is the diversification option won by a resounding margin. I do believe there are about 200 people who voted so I thank you all for casting your vote. And we have 85% of those voting in favor for new content such as guides for the economy, politics, army compositions, etc. However, in this particular video, I will be furthering my factional overview and guide series. And in particular, we will be looking at the army guide for the various factions. And for this very first episode of this kind, I am going to look at the Spartan faction, which has received a few updates in the 1.32 public beta patch that is available on the Steam Workshop and of course on the Divide Tempera website. However, that being said and done, this being the first episode, I'm pretty much going to explain the format of these army guide series. And pretty much I am going to divide this episode into five parts. With the first part, we are going to look over the roster of the faction and dive into the stats of each unit within that roster. In the second part, we will be looking at my personal subjective, of course, recommendation for army composition. And I will explain as to why I decide such an army composition. And pretty much you will see that recurring with all of the factions that I play with. Um, there are a few things I look out for when I set up my army composition. Moving on to the third part, we will be playing a custom battle against a standard template which is a Roman Marian Legion and I believe personally that if you can defeat a Roman Marian Legion decisively with the army composition you're rolling with then you're pretty much good to go for the campaign as the AI very rarely has troops of that high caliber that you will have to uh, face against. Um, next up in the fourth section, I will be talking about some of the units that you can acquire that are close to your starting region through the mercenary as well as the area of recruitment uh, mechanic that is available in Divere Tempera. And of course, these are the units that you would use to supplement your army for the weaknesses present in your roster. And so I will be going through these units and explain once again why I believe that they are worth for, worthwhile um, to recruit. And finally, in the fifth section of the Army Guide series, I will be explaining uh, what are the particular army traditions that favor the faction that you're playing with. In this case, of course, it's going to be Sparta. And also, what are my personal recommendations for the army skills uh, for the, your general, I'm sorry, for your general skills. And uh, keep in mind that all of this is very subjective. Of course, a lot of you may differ in your opinion on how I set up my armies, how I in fact even use my armies, but perhaps there are a few things that you can take from this uh, type of video and you can comment down in the comment section your disagreements, if anything, and in return, by reading those uh, constructive feedbacks i myself can perhaps learn something from the community in return however without any further ado let us hop into the first part of this episode all right my friends welcome to the first part of this army guide video for the spartan faction in which we will be looking over their roster and as you can see i have gone ahead and deployed my army in a formation that mimics the arrangement of the units in the custom battle menu and by that i mean to say we have our general in the first row followed by melee infantry spear infantry behind them phalanx infantry to follow followed by missile infantry melee cavalry and missile cavalry in the final row 
And the reason I have gone ahead and done this is so that you guys can get a feel for what this faction is all about by looking at the options available to the faction. And it comes as no surprise that in the case of Sparta, Phalanx Infantry Units is what Sparta is all about since they have just so many options of Phalanx Infantry Units. Now you can argue that they do have access to a lot of missile infantry and therefore Spartans also can be considered a missile heavy faction. However, it's not just the quantity of options available, but also the quality of these individual options. And as we will go through each units individually and their stats, you will find out why a lot of options that the Spartans have when it comes to the missile infantry are not really worth it in my personal opinion. However, that being said and done, let's hop into the first category, which is the generals. And when it comes to Sparta, you have only one option available, and that is your Royal Spartan Bodyguard. Now, these guys are not mounted, and that is because Spartans historically had a contempt or, co or condescended uh, cavalry units and instead uh, considered it to be brave to fight on foot as heavy infantry. However, that being said and done, uh, this unit is nothing to scoff at. In my personal opinion, they are the best hoplite unit in game bar none. Uh, they do also come with 300 men per unit, which is also quite significant. They have a really respectable melee attack for a hoplite unit at 9, extremely good melee defense at 21, an overall damage of uh, 30 which is an addition of your weapon damage of 26 and your armor penetration damage of 4 really good armor at 38 for an infantry unit amazing morale now these guys will not retreat they will not surrender they will pretty much fight almost to the last man and uh, you really have to kind of completely misuse this unit to lose it entirely next up we have the bonus versus elephants and cavalry and you can see it's at 25 each. And for those of you who haven't toyed around with the 1.32 public beta, you might wonder that this number is a bit higher than usual. And that is because the Dividea Tempera team have decided to overhaul the way how spear units work. Spear units no longer have expert charge defense, which means any cavalry charge they receive from the rear will be extremely devastating to them. And the cavalry unit in return will take no losses or no punishment from performing a successful rear charge. Conversely speaking, if a cavalry unit gets caught out by a spear unit and gets bogged down in a melee engagement, they will get absolutely annihilated as this bonus is applied not only to your melee attack, but also to your overall damage. So just to give you an idea of what that means in the case of the Royal Spartan Bodyguard, it means that your melee attack will be bumped up to 34 versus cavalry or elephant units. Meanwhile, your overall damage will be bumped up from 30 to a whopping 51. So that is, um, oh sorry, 55. And that is pretty insane. So definitely these units, nothing to scoff at. They are pretty good units, but you want to be careful with them uh, as if you get them into a bad situation, they do not have that mobility to get out of that bad situation. And you will unnecessarily take a lot of casualties in your first class population. However, with that, we can move on to the next category, which is your melee infantry. And as Sparta, you only have access to three options. And the first option is your Skiritai Swordsmen. Now, these guys come from the second class population. Um, and of course, considering that, I don't really, um, you know, consider them to be a good unit. I mean, they do have that stock ability, which is quite useful. It gives them a bit more versatility. They are a bit more attack oriented with their melee attack at 14, which is quite respectable for a swords unit, really. Uh, but they have really low armor, they are incredibly fragile, and that's not what you want for your second class or first class population, really. So I wouldn't really recommend these units. Uh, moving on to the next units, you have your allied Turios Swordsmen. Now these guys get unlocked during your Turios reforms, and they also come from the second class of your population, and uh, they are a bit more defensively oriented in comparison to the Skiritai Swordsmen. They do have 300 men per unit, but what sets this unit apart is that they actually have an ammunition of 3, and 
as such being a 300 men a strong unit uh, when they have an ammunition of three that means they have a total ammunition of 900 so if this unit manages to flank an enemy and unleash 900 javelins uh, into the backs of that enemy i think there's no need for an explanation what's going to be the fate of that enemy unit however once again they come from that second class population and these guys have hellenic counterparts in other hellenic factions such as the diadochi and the other hellenic city states and of course the uh, colonist uh, greek colonist uh, factions and in the case of those factions they actually come from the third class population so i would recommend getting them in those factions however for sparta considering that these guys come from the second class i would not recommend getting these units next up in the thorax reforms we unlock the spartan thorax swordsman now these guys have some pretty respectable stats they kind of like your skiritai swordsmen in that they are a bit more melee attack oriented and they pretty much have uh you know a comparable ratio of increment to their stats in comparison to the skiritai swordsmen they have 16 melee attack versus the 14 9 melee defense versus the 7 and of course 30 armor versus the 15 however i wouldn't once again recommend these units and that is because they actually come from your first class population which is better used elsewhere as sparta moving on to the next category we are going to take a look at our spearmen and pretty much it's the same situation as with our swordsmen you don't have a lot of good spear options which is kind of surprising as sparta you would expect to have good spear options but our very first options are our spartan helots which come from the third population class however these units are pretty trash and i wouldn't really recommend anyone get them even if you're absolutely desperate i mean a six melee attack that is abysmal 12 melee defense for a spear unit once again very abysmal one armor so these guys will get absolutely annihilated by any unit and for a spear unit keeping in mind that this is the 1.32 public beta and that they no longer have access to expert charge defense a bonus of only 13 versus cavalry and elephants significantly underwhelming which means that if we add it up they have a melee attack of only 19 and if you remember in the case of our spartan uh, bodyguard unit that 19 was actually a 34 so it's almost double that and in terms of weapon damage you only have a 36 weapon damage overall whereas in the case of your royal spartan bodyguard that number gets bumped up to 55 which is once again almost double so definitely do not recommend this unit not even worth looking at next up in the Turios reforms you unlock the allied Turios spearmen now these guys are the spear variant of their Turios sword uh, unit uh, they are quite respectable when it comes to stats i would say so definitely a lot better than your helot spearmen however they come from the second class population and once again in comparison to your hellenic counterparts uh, those guys come from the third class population so i would recommend getting uh, those Turius spearmen but not the spartan version which comes from the second class of your population now typically when i play a hellenic diadochi faction i try to get pike units as much as possible because they are without doubt the best frontline units uh, that you can get in divide tempera however they do have a weakness in that they are vulnerable to missile fire so i do recommend getting these units to kind of screen your pike units and absorb all that missile damage as they do have a large shield and uh, as such can take uh, some punishing from missile units but in the case of sparta once again since these guys come from the second class of your population i wouldn't recommend getting them finally we have the spartan youths now these guys have actually really good stats and you might think that that's not the case but they have eight melee attack 18 melee defense which is quite good uh, they have almost 30 weapon overall damage as you can see over here uh, their bonus versus cavalry and elephants is what makes them stand out and of course their unit speed at four which means they are extremely fast and can support your cavalry in taking down enemy cavalry with a bonus of 21 you have a melee attack chance of 29 and of course uh, you have an overall weapon damage of 49 which is quite good however 
this unit is extremely fragile and it comes from the first class population so definitely definitely do not recommend using these units because pretty much one minor mistake and you could pretty much lose half of this unit which is about a hundred moi or your first class spartan uh, units which is not good it's gonna it's gonna bite it's gonna take a long time to recover that in your population pool however that being said and done let's move on to the next category which is the phalanx units that are available to sparta and here is where sparta shines and you will see a role reversal when it comes to comparisons between the hellenic counterparts whereas in the case of your uh, melee infantry and your spear infantry your turios um, turios units come from your second class population uh, as opposed to the third class population which is available to the hellenics and the diadochi in the case of your phalanx infantry uh, your third class population units can go toe to toe with the second class population units of the hellenic world and by that i mean the very first unit we are looking here is the nia domodes or the freed helot hoplites now these guys come from the third class of a population and they have really respectable stats for it. They are incredibly cost effective and I would highly, highly, highly recommend using these units in your early game as they can pretty much go toe to toe with second class population hoplites of your Hellenic rivals. Uh, moving on to the next unit, you have your Perioikoi Hoplite. Now these guys come from the second class population and they do have some pretty respectable stats but in comparison to your helot hoplites which do come from the third class population uh, their stats are not that significantly better as you can see they only have one extra melee defense and about an extra armor now i will get a lot of criticism possibly for saying this but i strongly believe it armor is overrated in divide et impera and in rome 2 total war and that is because armor is not a flat value that will be applied regardless. And conversely, it is actually a uh, random generated number. Anywhere between, in the case of the periocular hoplite, you can roll a number from 1 to 30. And in the case of um, your helot hoplite, you can roll a number between 1 and 20. So pretty much when an enemy attack lands on you, uh, you roll anywhere between 1 to 30 and if that number is 1 then you only block 1 of the weapon damage which pretty much means you take 21 plus 4 damage which is 25. Conversely if you get lucky and the Nira Demodes rolls a 20 you can see how you will end up blocking a lot more damage. So it's it doesn't mean I don't mean to say that armor is completely useless. Of course the higher this number is the better your probability of rolling a better number however it's not as good as some of the other stats in my humble opinion uh, and when i say some of the other stats i mean the melee attack melee defense and your overall damage which is a combination of your weapon damage and your armor penetration damage however that being said and done let's move on to the next unit which is your spartan hoplite now your spartan hoplite of course they come from the first class population unit and um these guys have really good stats. They have a melee attack of 18, a, a melee defense of 17, really good armor at 30, and really good weapon damage at 28. And yes, I would recommend these guys. However, I would not go too much overboard as you can deplete your first class population. So use these guys sparingly and uh, make sure that you use them in a position where they don't get to see a lot of the action and they pretty much will serve as a last line in case the battle gets really desperate uh, next up we have the spartan guest hoplites and now these guys are my favorite hoplites available to the spartan faction and that is because i actually convinced the divide at emperor team to change their population class now these guys are guests of sparta so they don't come from the spartan citizenry which is typically the first second and third class of population being guests means they are foreigners so i convinced the divide at emperor team to make them fourth class population which is the xenoi in the case of the spartans and 
although they do take three turns to recruit this is absolutely worth it uh, coming from the fourth class of uh, population and as you can see they even have better stats than the spartan hoplite so definitely get these guys as soon as you can as uh, these guys are pretty much equivalent to um to roman auxilia in that they are really elite tier units coming from the foreign population class and as such are extremely easy to replenish next up we have access to the reform spartan hoplites which are basically an upgrade of your spartan hoplites and these guys get up upgraded in the thurios reforms uh pretty much a similar stats to uh the Spartan Hoplites, however, a slight increment in the melee defense and, of course, the armor. Now, you could go ahead and get these guys, but I recommend not to get them because you can obviously use your population for Spartan Guest Hoplites instead. And pretty much uh, the only difference between the two units is that these units have just uh, one less melee defense. And, of course, they have uh, exactly the same armor, so... Yeah, nothing much to uh, separate these two units and uh, the fourth class population is totally worth using these units for however that being said and done we are done with all hoplite units for the spartan faction those of you who have played sparta before would know that there is a thorax version of this spartan hoplite unit however that has been removed with the 1.32 public beta upon my insistence now before you go up in arms against me you will soon see why that is moving on to the next unit we have the nia demodes phalangite which is pretty much the pike version of your nia demodes hoplite and these guys come from the third class population unit and um, as such they are actually got really good stats once again a very cost effective unit um, they can go toe to toe with most second class uh, hellenic units uh, such as your Ergaman uh, pikemen as well as uh, you know your Athenian pikemen so these guys are actually uh, really worth it in my opinion and I would recommend getting them if you can in your campaign and you should be able to because they're quite easily accessible and as I mentioned before you can see the total role reversal when it comes to phalanx units Spartan population 3 actually can go toe to toe with the population 2 of your Hellenic and Diadochi rivals however when it comes to the Diadochi rivals I would be a little bit careful when uh, trying to pit these guys against bronze shield pikemen because bronze shield pikemen are actually quite hardy in comparison to this unit and rightly so. Moving on to the next pikemen that we have available, we have uh, the Spartan pikemen. Now these guys are actually really good and of course they unlock during the Thurios reforms like the Neo Demodes pikemen. Now these guys are actually better than the bronze shield pikemen and that they don't have as much armor the bronze shield pikemen have 35 but what they do have is a better weapon entry giving them a melee attack and a melee defense of 11 which keep in mind will increase because as sparta each and every single one of your units get by default as part of the faction buff or the faction trait uh plus two experience so it typically means that sparta is kind of like a notch above all infantry units uh, just as a baseline because if i give this unit two veteran uh, veteran ranks the melee attack and the melee defense actually increases by a number of one next up we have the reason why the spartan thorax hoplite are no more and that's because i pushed for the spartan thorax pikemen which in my opinion are an upgrade now these units are available during the thorax reforms and they are a direct upgrade of the spartan pikemen and of course since they do replace that thorax hoplite i have gone ahead and used the similar look for the unit but i have also included some uh, you know some scaled uh, linothorax kind of armor which is more appropriate for a phalangite type unit now these units are actually incredible they can pretty much go to with a thorax bronze shield pikemen of the diadochi faction and they can also hold their own versus uh, the more elite pike units such as the silver shield pikemen of the seleucids as well as the agema pikemen of the 
a pirate kingdom. So these guys are quite good. And keep in mind, uh, with that double uh, army experience chevron, their melee attack will be at 12 and their melee defense will be at 14, which is the equivalent of the silver shield and the Agema stats. So I would fit these guys against those unit man for man. However, that being said and done, let's move on to the next category, which is our missile units. And I am going to go quickly through the missile units because there's nothing much to see here. We start off with our Hella Javelin men. These guys come from the third class population and they are absolutely trash tier. They are below generic Javelin men, so I wouldn't really ever get them. Next up, we have our Skiritai Peltast. They are pretty much the same below average. However, like the Skiritai Swordsmen, they have the stock ability, which means that they could be useful in being used to easily flank the enemy units. However, once again, I wouldn't really recommend these units. Next up, we have the Allied Peltas. Now, these guys are quite good. They have an armor of 25, uh, decent melee attack and melee defense, which is actually comparable to your Allied Swordsmen. However, in the case of the Allied Swordsmen, you have 300 men per unit as opposed to 175. So once again, I wouldn't recommend these guys as they do come from the second class population, but that's not the big deal. Um, I mean, it's kind of on the fence with this unit. I mean, you could recruit them if you want to, if you fancy. Me personally, I wouldn't. Next up, we have the Helot Slingers, possibly the worst unit in the entire game, bar none. And the reason being is as a slinger unit, they have absolutely abysmal range of only 165, which is actually, in fact, the average missile range for archer units. So you can just imagine how horrible they are. Apart from that, they only have three melee attack, five melee defense, no armor. So these units are pretty much, uh, you know, just free cannon fodder or, you know, just free meat for the enemy. So if you want to lose a battle, hire these units. Next up, we have the Helot Archers, and like the Slingers, they are they belong in the trash can. Uh, absolutely horrible units, even though they come from the third class population, I wouldn't recommend getting them. I mean, in the early game, you don't have a lot of choice, so you could go ahead and get them in order to preserve your second or third class population, uh, or your second class, I'm sorry, your second class population. Um, but once again, they are not really good in comparison to other archer units. Finally, we have our allied archers. These guys come from the second population class and uh, they have pretty respectable stats in that they have 20 armor, 165, which is average for an archer unit and a missile damage of 15. No really good melee stats, so they're pretty much useless after they expend their missiles. Once again, I wouldn't really recommend using these units and when it comes to missile units for Sparta, I would recommend turning towards mercenary units and AOR units as is the same for your melee units. I would recommend turning towards mercenaries and AOR units instead and uh, pretty much we'll cover that on the uh, or during the fourth section of this video. Next up, we have our melee cavalry and with melee cavalry, we only have two options. The first option is your allied cavalry comes from the second class population and uh, as you can see um, they have pretty uh, slightly below average stats so yeah nothing much to talk about these units uh, they are a purely melee cavalry in that they have shield they are not going to be very good on the charge so these guys have a bit of staying power however their counterparts are going to be better than them so once again i wouldn't recommend using this unit and one of the things that i do recommend when you hire cavalry is to watch out for this number because there are only two to three types of numbers when it comes to cavalry units you have 100 120 and 140 which is incredibly rare to see I would always recommend trying to find the 120 units because the 120 units can take out a 100 man unit and they are a lot better. Next up we have the picked Ionian Lancers and like your Spartan guest Hoplite, they come from the 4th population class and they are actually quite good and they also take 3 turns to recruit. And since they come from the 4th population class, they are actually quite worth it in my opinion. They have pretty generic shock cavalry attributes uh, with 15 melee attack, 6 melee defense, 
a good weapon damage, overall damage of 33. Uh, of course, a bonus versus infantry and cavalry. So quite clearly, you can see these guys are meant to charge at the back of infantry as opposed to cavalry engagements. But they can do quite well if properly managed against cavalry. They have respectable armor at 38. Their speed is not too great, but 6 is quite average for a heavy shock cavalry unit. However, that being said and done, they are 100 men per unit, so I would recommend looking towards mercenaries and AOR units for better options. Next up, we have our missile cavalry and nothing much to see here. You just have two options. The first option is your Spartan cavalry, and now these guys are pretty much uh, punished by the Spartans because they are deemed unfit to form up as a phalanx unit, and so they are being put on a horse. And as such, they are not really any good units. Um, they are pretty average in terms of missile uh, or skirmisher cavalry stats. And I wouldn't recommend getting them because they are also quite fragile. So if they get caught out by another cavalry unit, they're going to take a lot of damage. And considering that they come from your first class population, it's going to be hard to replace these units. So completely ignore these units. However, unfortunately, before your Turius reforms, these are the only cavalry you have access to. But thankfully, you can hire mercenaries. Next up, we have the Allied Turios Cavalry. And like your Spartan uh, Cavalry, most uh, missile cavalry have 120 men per unit. And this unit is quite good, but it does come from your second population class. I would say, I mean, if you fancy, you can go ahead and get these units. I wouldn't uh, say anything against them. However, I can just simply say the one thing, you do have better options when it comes to mercenaries and AOR as far as cavalry is concerned. And so with that, uh, I think we are done with the roster overview for the Spartans. So I'm going to go ahead and end this section and I will see you all in the next section in which we talk about the army composition for the Spartans. All right, my friends, welcome to the second part of this episode in which we will be talking about my personal recommendations for the Spartan army composition. And before we go ahead and do that, as you all can see on the screen over here, I have loaded up a preset of a Roman test legion, which is a typical Roman Marian legion. And the reason I do this is because before I go ahead and hop into the campaign, I like to test out my army composition against a standard Roman Marian legion and see how well it performs on the battlefield. Typically, you're going to look for a decisive victory and if you can achieve that with the army composition of your selection, then you are good to go for the campaign because it is quite rare for the AI to field an army that's this high in quality. However, with that being said and done, let us hop towards creating the army composition that I personally find ideal for Sparta. Before we go ahead and actually do that, I'm just going to explain two of the main reasonings I use when I decide my army composition. The first main chain of thought is that I want to spread out the population that I'm using within the army. And that is because in Dividate Empera, population is a very important mechanic. You have four population classes with the first class being extremely rare and difficult to grow. And of course, the maximum growth rate is of your foreign population class, which is also one of the reasons why Roma as a faction is incredibly powerful because they have access to really elite tier auxilia unit that come from the fourth population class. So, and the second thing that I like to keep in mind is that I want my armies to be versatile. And by versatile, I mean I could technically just stack all hoplites like this. And uh, pretty much this army can be a pretty memeish army, right? In the sense that uh, this army can pretty much take on any infantry unit in the game and perhaps even stand their ground. However, it might not be very good to use this army on an open field. I mean, while this army can perform well, maybe even in a siege, because again, it's all melee infantry, in an open field, you are going to be surrounded by cavalry, you're going to be hit by missiles on all sides. This army doesn't have any support, and as a phalanx unit, uh, it will take a lot of casualties if it is flanked. So, you want more versatility in your army so that your army is capable of dealing with any situation, with any threat, 
or a, you know any kind of army now for example this army while it might seem very elite full of first class population spartan hoplites it is going to get absolutely shredded against a nomadic horse archer army and there is absolutely no chance for survival for this unit or for this army so typically you want to spread out your variety and you want to spread out your population class as well and now speaking of population class you are going to select the first population class and typically i like to go for excluding the general which is always the first population class i like to go for four extra for first population class in case i am going for cavalry however if i am selecting infantry then i will select a maximum of three first class population units and in the case of Sparta, this is one of the reasons I absolutely love the faction is that it's so unique because most of the factions in Divide Tempera Rome to Total War actually have elite first class cavalry units. So you will most likely be fielding cavalry nobility. However, in the case of Sparta, they are not really a cavalry focused faction. Instead, they are an infantry focused faction and therefore your first class population comes from or forms up your core infantry so it's quite the reverse and instead when it comes to cavalry missiles and other support units you're looking to foreign population class or your third population class or your second population class so considering that it is infantry and infantry has more men per unit i am going to go with three first class population next up i am going to go with four to five uh, second class population units as you can see over here perioikoi then after that, I can go for six third class population units like we are seeing over here. And lastly, you can go for six. I'm sorry, uh, go for five um, third class population units. And then finally, you can go for six foreign class population units. You can even change this up by adding a sixth third class population. So now right now, you can see the ratio is three is to four is to five is to five. And of course, your general. Uh, should not technically be counted because you don't really have an option when it comes to your general. Most of the times he is going to be from the first class population and in very few random cases he comes from the second class population which in my opinion doesn't really make much sense. However, it is what it is. Um, now that we have uh, dis determined the uh, type of population that we are going to deal with, let us go ahead and replace them one by one. So when it comes to our first class population infantrymen, the best option we have available without a shred of doubt is our thorax pikemen and i want to support and the thorax pikemen will form the core of our infantry line and uh, i need a longer core uh, of at least six units four to six units at least so i need to get more pikemen and i need to get now the near the modes phalangite that come from the third class population so let's go ahead Get rid of three of those, get three near the modes, third class population. Now, to protect these phalangites on the flanks, we need hoplite units. But thankfully for us, we have access to Spartan guest hoplites that come from the foreign population class. So let's go ahead, get three of them over here. Meanwhile, they will be on the left flank and then we get our Spartan thorax pikemen all the way up to the right flank. All right, finally, we need to now get melee infantry, which are important and versatile because they can fight as flanking units. And at the same time, they can uh, scale the walls during a siege and fight well on the rampart. So even though Sparta is a faction that's heavily focused on spear units, we have to forego that and we have to go and get ahead and get some melee units that are good at flanking. And ideally, I would recommend uh, relying on mercenaries, which as I will show in section 4 of this video however for the sake of this custom battle i am going to go ahead and select the allied Turio swordsman and i typically like to get four of them uh, and i will use two as a flanking force and the other two as to support uh, the right flank of my core infantry next up we can get some uh, missile units and with missile units uh, each missile unit fulfills a different role, like slingers are really good against armored units. However, Spartan helot slingers are absolutely garbage, so don't ever get them. Uh, Elta stays can do a lot of damage, and however, they do lack ammunition. So they are pretty good if you flank the unit and use their ammunition very wisely, and I do like Pelta stay myself. 
However, as Sparta, I do recommend getting just two missile units. And because of that, I actually recommend getting archers because archers, while they may not be a master of anything, they are a jack of all trades, which means not only can they do a lot of damage, they have a lot of missile uh, ammunition. And of course, they can arch their projectiles over your front lines. They can burn down fortifications and wooden settlements. So archers are quite versatile. And when you don't have that many uh, slots for units, then I suggest picking the unit with the most versatility. And that is why I, of course, pick the allied archers. Lastly, we are going to fill out our last floor four slots with cavalry. Now, I always recommend a minimum of four cavalry, a maximum if you're a horse nomadic, uh, nomadic horse archer army. Of course, it can be an entire army full of cavalry. However, for civilized factions and of course for the other factions that don't predominantly rely on horse rosters, I would recommend anywhere between four to a maximum of six cavalry units. And once again, with cavalry units, the more you get, the more uh, you want to spread out their versatile role. So for example, if I do get six cavalry, I want to get some missile cavalry units like shown over here. However, Let's go ahead and form up our army and yeah that is perfect and before we go ahead and attack the Romans I'm actually going to select the entire army and give it two ranks of veterancy since Sparta as a faction gets access to these veteran ranks as a default so you will never see a, um, a unit like this with Sparta it will always come with two chevrons so technically this is what the unit you get as Sparta is however without any further ado let us end this section and hop on to the next section which is the battle all right welcome to the battle the very first thing i like to do is hit down on that control a move the entire army behind then i like to group my general archers in group two and cavalry on the left and right flanks from group one to group four the reason i do this is because these groups are easily accessible to my left hand and I recommend doing the same. Next up, I'm going to put my Spartan guest hoplites in group 5 and kind of put them up ahead onto that left flank. Uh, we are going to select all of our core pike infantry and narrow down the formation holding on that control and down arrow key. And then we are going to group them up as group 6. Now, the reason why I like a narrow formation is uh, because, as you know, in Total War uh, Rome 2, the AI tends to blob up and what that means is that if you keep your formation really narrow as you do over here the enemy blob might attack one section of your entire front line which means all the other units have been effectively taken out of the fight and this unit over here is definitely going to lose against the excessive pressure however if you keep your formation a bit more narrow they become a bit more susceptible to uh, missile fire however they fare a lot better in my opinion against uh, melee uh, troops because the melee troops that blob up will be pretty much attacked by our entire front line uh, next up on the right flank we want to go ahead and place two of our Turio Foroi spearmen uh, sorry swordsmen and of course on the prestigious right flank we will have our Spartan uh, royal Spartan bodyguard Right, and now as you can see we have uh, created an oblique order and by an oblique order which means our one flank is kind of advanced meanwhile our other flanks is refused uh, or declined from the enemy which means that the enemy is being enticed to attack my left flank and will have to put in more work in order to reach and attack my right flank. And the reason you do this is if you want to preserve a certain type of unit. And in the case of Sparta, as you can see over here, I have gone ahead and put my guest uh, or my trophy moi, which is my Spartan guest hoplite that comes from the fourth class population in a vulnerable position, which means the enemy will focus onto this unit and it will take the brunt of the casualties thereby preserving my citizen troops such as uh, as you can see the near demodes phalangite which comes from the third class population and further uh, declined is my spartan thorax pikemen and of course my general is completely declined uh, apart from that uh, what happens is that it is easier for the enemy to flank this unit because it's a bit more advanced but a lot harder 
for it to flank this unit so my right flank is absolutely secured with this formation now you might ask that there could be another way to do it and the other way to do it is to keep my left flank declined and my right flank right flank advanced and typically why i don't do this is historically of course the right flank was held by the prestigious general or the best of the best units um but what i want to do uh, is that also historically uh, so to speak um you know in the battle of luktra which was uh, ironically fought against the spartans and they lost thebans actually uh, advanced their left flank and the reason you advance your left flank is because the uh, left flank of your left flank is exposed or easier to access and it is the shielded side which means it is the more stronger side and the less vulnerable side of a phalanx formation as opposed to this right flank which you can see over here is exposed however it's not so much exposed because of course these phalangity units when they lower their pikes they will kind of protect that exposed side enemy enemy any enemy unit trying to get to that exposed side will have to fight through a wall of pikes to get there meanwhile of course as you can see over here our general's right flank is completely undefended but of course we are going to put a couple of our own cavalry units over there and we're going to hit that control key and uh, you know create a narrower formation with our cavalry so we have a cavalry on the left and right flank and since our left flank is going to be more vulnerable we're going to shift our support troops onto that left flank to quickly relieve that left flank now another mistake i see a lot of players doing is that uh, while they keep their front line as a contiguous line which i do approve of it makes no sense to have gaps in your front line uh, what they do is that they actually keep their cavalry as a continuous line and i actually completely uh, reject uh, you know using it like this like they, they pretty much keep it like this select the entire cavalry move it all around the battlefield you know with one command so basically they have just a single unit of cavalry in my opinion as opposed to having two units of cavalry uh, pretty much if they have an enemy unit over there they will issue an order to charge at the enemy unit and what that actually ends up doing is that both of these cavalries will collide against each other and uh, they will not be able to apply the maximum impact damage on that enemy unit ideally what you want to do is you want to charge with one unit and then flank and hit the unit on the rear in the best case scenario if you spot an enemy cav making a charge towards let's say the cavalry on your right flank what you want to do is you want to retreat this cavalry and interrupt their charge with the cavalry on the left uh, that will fix this unit in place they will not get to apply their own charge impact and once they're fixed in pay place and take damage from the charge a clean damage from a clean charge from this left cavalry unit you can bring back the right cavalry unit to hit it once again in the rear so just a few things when it comes to micromanagement however that being said and done let's go ahead start the battle select control a hold down any unit within the army with your left mouse button Keep holding down that left mouse button and drag it forward to position your army. But as you can see, there are two arrow marks, which means your army will run into formation. However, if you hold down the control key, it converts into a single arrow, which means they will walk. If I release it, two arrows. If I hold it down, single arrow key. And as you can see, they are slowly walking into formation. Now, the reason I always recommend, let's go ahead and fast forward. The reason I always recommend walking into formation or walking up to the enemy is that you relatively stay in cohesion as opposed to be uh, as opposed to being completely out of formation your archers ahead your pikemen behind your cavalry all the way up ahead and you could get caught out in a very bad situation if the enemy decides to you know exploit that so definitely keep walking so that your army moves in a cohesive order and speaking of moving our army, let's actually align our army onto the left flank of the enemy. Like so. And uh, another reason you want to, you know, move your army slowly is you want to conserve stamina. Stamina is a pretty significant modifier in Dividea Tempera. And at the maximum stamina penalty, which is exhausted, you get a 
50% penalty to all your stats, excluding, of course, armor and all those kind of stats. But of course, your melee attack, your melee defense, all of that's going to reduce by 50%, which is quite significant. Uh, however, that being said and done, now the reason, before I go ahead and move my army any closer to the enemy unit, um, the reason I am aligning my left flank to the enemy unit's right flank is that I don't want this left flank, which is more susceptible to being flanked, by being flanked uh, so yeah i don't want them to get flanked as easily another reason is i actually want my uh declined flank or my refused flank to actually get involved in the fighting sooner or later um and typically later if possible and the way that's going to happen is if these units can uh, believe that they can reach these units which is what they're going to attempt to do however uh, what happens by keeping these guys closer to the left flank is that uh, since they are advanced, they are going to be the first target of the enemy archers who are going to shoot them in their unshielded side. So that is, uh, you know, kind of slightly unfortunate, but it is a small trade-off um, as opposed to if I keep these units somewhere in the center, what typically ends up happening is that the entire enemy front is going to focus on these units completely ignoring my uh, refused flank and as a phalanx army uh, it's not easy to flank or to maneuver with your army so um, you know having uh, sections of your army that are completely disengaged means it's going to take a while for you to get them into the fighting so you really want that initial positioning to be 100% on key now speaking of our army we can quickly just have a quick look over here go ahead maybe pause and i am going to divide my army up into three sections over here when i talk about them and that's the left flank the left flank you have two cavalry units our hoplite units the supporting archers and turio spearmen and now we have our core center which is pretty much our you know general and the Oh, sorry, um, which is pretty much our pikemen. So our six pikemen. Then we have the right flank, which is basically our two swordsmen, our general, as well as the other two cavalry units. So what we are going to do right now is we are going to unpause firstly, and then we are going to advance our left flank. So simply select the left flank by drag clicking it, and then go ahead and advance them. We can quickly run our hoplites into formation. And the minute these archers start to target these hoplite units, we are going to engage the phalanx formation, which means they can, uh, you know, brace for some more missile uh, damage. All right. Wonderful. Now that being done, we are going to keep uh, marching our left flank more forward. And our left flank will get slightly exposed uh, or slightly isolated if we do not move up our right flank in order to support it. So we are going to slowly move up our right flank as well. And as you can see, we are taking, I mean, we are being a little bit passive over here. We can choose to run now with the hoplite units. But as you can see, the enemy hasn't been able to do any damage so far. It is significantly weakening, especially this hoplite unit over here. Uh, but it is a fourth class population unit, so that is a trade-off I am willing to make. Once our archers are actually close enough, what we are going to do is we are going to quickly use our archers to target the enemy cavalry, soften them up. We're going to ignore the enemy missile units, especially these Roman heavy missile units. They are quite powerful and uh, they can pretty much tank a lot of damage. And uh, let's not forget to put our archers on that guard mode. Quickly, we want to move up our hoplites because they can take damage if you're not careful over here. And archers are going to move up. Meanwhile, move up our pike infantry quickly. Move up our right flank of infantry also quickly. Quickly get uh, this cavalry kind of split up. Quick look over here. This cavalry is taking some jab, uh, jab fire. So quickly over there. Put our phalanx unit in that formation. Okay. Wonderful. And group 6 we can slightly move you over here. 
so that you protect that flank, that exposed flank. Meanwhile, our cavalry can begin their encirclement. Okay. And now that the enemy has completely engaged us, we can kind of move around to try to counter encircle the enemy and as you can see they are nicely spread over here the only danger is of course uh you know that hoplite unit that has taken a fair bit of damage however nothing too much nothing we can't deal with and uh it's surprising that their cavalry is being so passive but usually the cavalry will make a charge for it and as you can see the cavalry is charging so we're going to pull this cavalry back we're going to do the typical hit the typical interfere with the charge and with the charge interfered we can go ahead we didn't quite pull that off uh, entirely perfectly however not too bad meanwhile on the left flank let's quickly move our troops around in order to flank over there and uh, our general is also engaged meanwhile our archers can now turn around and this is the advantage of keeping our archers on that left flank is that they can turn around and now hit the enemy on its unshielded side and a quick look at the mini map we're going to charge over here again don't make the mistake of using cavalry as a single blob if you can afford to do so and now that our archers are turned around they can start firing over here into the weaker side of this unit quickly charge with our cavalry over there as well the enemy general is kind of on a retreat mode so let's go ahead and target some other units over here try to move our cavalry as well while these units are nicely throwing their javelins into the backs of the enemy Go ahead, charge. Our archers are doing a good job clearing up that right flank. And if we defeat the right flank over here, then it can be pretty much game over for the Romans. We are not going to commit this swordsman just yet because it is kind of being engaged by that unit over there. Meanwhile, this cavalry unit can charge into those archers. get those cavalry units out of the fight and we have managed to do so so now we can charge into the backs i'm gonna keep doing that wonderful we're nearly done with the right flank over here and we kind of have to relieve our left flank because this area is as i said it's going to be the trouble spot but um you know we're gonna have to try to relieve it or they might break so keep an eye out for that uh, should that happen to you in your battles however as you can see over here the right flank is soon to crumble which means we should be able to support our left flank so let's go ahead and actually support our left flank we can throw in our archers over there as well so that uh, you know they end up uh, reinforcing that area quickly move our horsemen we want to charge into the backs of these units and the sooner we can encircle these units the better you can see they are already starting to waver go ahead charge over here split up our charge we don't want to once again blob up it's going to be hard not to blob up but uh, it is part of using cavalry is that you tend to blob up what you want to do is to avoid the blobbing as much as possible Okay. 
quickly move the other cavalry and it's good the entire enemy cavalry if they are out of the fight that means we will have free reign to do what we want and now we have just received that free reign and as you can see the entire enemy army is retreating and with that we have won a decisive victory against the romans so i'm gonna go ahead end the battle and i will see you all in the end turn screen in which we will go through uh, the different units and how they performed during this battle so as you can see it was a decisive victory we only lost 739 men we managed to you know quickly uh, rout the roman army we didn't inflict a lot of casualties however if we continued the battle it would pretty much be a slaughter so yeah that's good and as far as you can see over here our units did quite well of course this unit of spartan guess hoplite took Quite a bit of casualties but that's fine it comes from the fourth class population our swordsmen as i said they are pretty substandard so they did take some damage as well i would recommend replacing these guys and i will talk about what their replacements will be in the next section and uh, also uh, our cavalry did quite decent considering uh, they are the base roster cavalry available to the Spartan factions. But of course, you can further improve upon this. And as expected against Rome, archers will not do a lot of damage. However, whatever damage they did manage to do, uh, it was quite significant. So yeah, with that, let's hop on to the next section, which is pretty much going to talk about all of the mercenary and AOR options that I would recommend for the Spartan faction. Alright my friends, welcome to the fourth part of the video. Over here we are going to take a look at the mercenary and area of recruitment options that I recommend for the Spartan faction in order to supplement the deficiencies of the Spartan army. And speaking of the deficiencies in particular, you are talking about ranged infantry, melee infantry and cavalry units. First up, we have the provinces that are near to Sparta itself. These include Asia, Macedonia and your starting province of Hellas. In the provinces of Asia and Hellas, you can access Cretan archers. These guys have good armor, very good missile damage, an excellent rate of fire and even a small shield to prevent incoming missile damage. You can also get access to Rhodian mercenary slingers who alongside the Balearic slingers are considered to be the best slinger unit in the game with a range of 215 and a good overall damage for a slinger. In the province of Asia, you can also access the AOR Carrion Axemen. They have a whopping 33 melee damage, 14 of which comes from armor penetration. What's more is that this unit has 300 men in it, so they are really perfect for filling out the ranks of your melee infantry requirement. In the province of Macedonia and also available in the province of Thracia, we get access to one of my personal favorite units, the Agrianian Sellswords. These bad boys have a total melee damage of 35, 15 of which comes from armor penetration. I can totally swear by these guys, they are so versatile, they can be used on the walls, they can be used as flanking units on the battlefield, and they can also hold their own since they do have respectable defense stats, and I have personally witnessed them in a 20 versus 20 battle, racking up about 600 to 800 kills per unit when used right. Now let's take a look at the provinces that are a little bit further away from Sparta but will still be within your reach during the early game. These include the provinces of Thracia, Bithynia at Pontus and Galatia at Cappadocia. In the province of Thracia, you can access the Thracian mercenary warriors. These units use a Falx as a weapon entry which is similar to the Odrysian Rumphaii warriors and as such they have an insane damage of 38. 13 of which is melee armor penetration. However, unlike the Agrianian Sellswords, they sacrifice some of their defensive capabilities for offensive stats and as such are a bit less versatile in my opinion. However, when used right, these units can dish out some serious punishment. In the provinces of Bithynia at Pontus, you can also access AOR Phrygian Axemen who have an overall melee damage of 33, 14 of which comes from armor penetration. You can also access Cappadocian Hired Lancers and they are also present in the province of Galatia at Cappadocia. These are one of the best mercenary and AOR shock cavalry units in the game. The reason being is because they use one of the heaviest mount entries in the game. And while this might not be known to most of the average gamers, as a modder, 
and as a modder i can dive into the data files and i can pull out and pretty much share with you guys some of these hidden gems and the cappadocian lancers have a entry that is almost the equivalent of your maripos cavalry that is available to gallic factions their only drawback however is that they do have 100 men per unit and as such uh, you know there are better options that have 120 men per unit in Bithynia at Pontus and Galatia at Cappadocia, you can also access Galatian mercenary spearmen. And while at Sparta, you may not need spearmen, these guys are noteworthy mentioned because like your Spartan youth, they are actually a shock spear unit, which means they can be used to complement your cavalry should you choose to recruit men. And they actually come from the fourth class population as opposed to the first class population in the case of the Spartan youth. In the province of Galatia at Cappadocia, finally, you can also access two AOR swords units that are comparable to Roman legionaries. These are the Galatian Chosen Swordsmen and the Galatian Thorax Swordsmen. Both of these units have identical stats with good melee attack, decent melee defense and an overall weapon damage of 32. However, keep in mind that they have a slow movement and as such might not be ideal at flanking. However, they are really good at taking the walls of a walled settlement. Next up, we can turn our attention to the provinces that are a fair distance from your starting settlement but will still be within reach by the middle game during your Thurios reforms. These include Pannonia, Dacia, Sarmatia, Syria, Haestan and Kavkasos. In the province of Pannonia, you can recruit the Scordisiae Elite Swordsmen which are an AOR unit with an overall melee damage of 36, 11 of which is melee armor penetration. Their other stats are also incredible with a melee attack of 15, a melee defense of 11 and an armor of 35. These guys are legionaries on steroids. Meanwhile in Dacia is where we start to see our first 120 men cavalry unit of this section of the guide. And these are the Dacian hired riders. They are pretty much a very generic melee cavalry unit comparable to the melee cavalry unit of other factions however they do have 120 men per unit and that makes them stand out from the rest in the provinces of sarmatia we get access to sarmatian cataphracts which are an aor unit with a very heavy cavalry entry which means they pack a mean punch on the charge however once again like the cappadocian lancers these guys are only 100 men per unit but still that mount entry makes them worth it in my opinion in the provinces of Hairsden and Caucasus, meanwhile, you can recruit the Armenian Azad Cavalry. These are a melee cavalry unit with a precursor javelin entry, a very heavy horse entry and 120 men per unit. You can also get access to the Armenian armored horse archers that share the same number of men and horse entry as the Armenian Azad Cavalry, however these are horse archer units as well. Finally, in the province of Syria, you can recruit Syrian mercenary archers and the AOR version of that same archer, as well as you can get access to Syrian war elephants. Now, these AOR units are undisputedly the best possible elephant unit that you can access if, of course, we ignore the distant and isolated Mauryans. Now we can take a look into the next group of provinces which will be attainable during the late middle game as you are approaching your thorax reforms. These include Narbonensis, Phosphorus and Scythia. In Narbonensis you can recruit mercenary Volke veteran riders. These units have the Maripos cavalry entry and as such can have a deadly charge as a result of their increased mass. However they do only come in 100 men per unit but are still worth it in my opinion. Meanwhile, in the Bosphorus, you get access to two AOR units, the Scythian Heavy Archers and the Scythian Warriors. With the Scythian Heavy Archers, they have a range of 185, a missile damage of 18, an overall melee damage of 33, 14 of which is melee armor penetration damage. And as such, it comes as no surprise as to why these guys are on my list of recommended AOR units. They are absolutely beastly and for those of you who are following my Mithridates livestream will just know how good these guys can really be. Meanwhile the Scythian warriors have an overall melee damage of 33, 14 of which is armor penetration, 35 armor and 300 men per unit. Next up in the province of Scythia you can recruit the Scythian mercenary armored horse archer which is a heavily armored horse archer lancer cavalry hybrid that has the heavy mount entry. 
And in fact, this entry is even more than the Mariposa entry, which is available to some of the Gallic factions. They also come with 120 men per unit, and you can also recruit in Skidia Roxolani Lancers, which are an AOR unit that shares the exact same mount entry and also are 120 men per unit. However, this unit, as opposed to the Scythian mercenary Armored Horse Archer, is purely a shock cavalry unit. Finally, we can look into the last group of provinces which is furthest away from Sparta and will be attainable in the late game. There is only one province to talk about in this regard and that is Parthia, where you can recruit two versions of the Nicene Cavalry which is one of the heaviest mount units in the game. The only mount unit that is heavier than the Nicene Cavalry is the super heavy Nicene Cavalry unit. And of course when I say the only unit that is heavier than this, I am talking about cavalry units. Of course your chariots and your elephant units are going to have a lot more mass than most of your cavalry units. The first version however of the Nicene Cavalry is an AOR unit and this unit is more of a melee cavalry with a good charge while the second version is the Parthian Hired Cataphracts which in my opinion is the best mercenary cavalry unit attainable in the game bar none. Both of these units come with 120 men per unit. Now that we have covered the recommended mercenaries and area of recruitment units that can be used to supplement the Spartan army, let us finally move on to the final section of this guide in which I will be talking about the army traditions as well as the general skills that I recommend for Sparta. Alright, this has been a long video but we are finally here in the final part of the guide. And in this part we will be talking about the army traditions and the general skills that I recommend for Sparta and I will go ahead and explain why. And as such I have loaded up a save game that I have amended using the save game parser to give my army as well as my general the maximum rank as well as the maximum points available to uh, kind of get uh, all the skills that we need to showcase in this section of the guide. However, without any further ado, let us go ahead and select the general skills that I recommend. I always recommend getting the Military Logistician, and that's because it gives a minus 15 upkeep for all land units. So let's go ahead and select all three of those, because eventually we are going to try to uh, have to fill them out to its maximum. can even fill out that one. Next up, uh, we could get the extra replenishment rate. We have several options because we have unlocked them. We could get the military's conscriptor that gives increased replenishment rate. For those of you who follow my Let's Play series, you know that I typically get this one. Apart from that, you can get the Master of Scouts that gives an increased campaign movement range, plus 9 as line of sight, and of course a greater chance of uh, discovering armies that are in ambush stands. So this is quite good actually in a campaign, especially if you want to play extremely fast and uh, I would actually also recommend this, but uh, of course it has no real effect in the battle itself, so uh, it's more of a campaign kind of a modifier. I mean, all of these over here, uh, uh, two of these are more campaign modifiers than actual battle modifiers. Uh, next up we have the Quartermaster, which gives plus 30 ammunition for all missile units. This is more of a battle modifier, but as Sparta, you're going to have just two to four missile units so i wouldn't really recommend getting this uh, skill at all and finally you have the mercenary connections which gives a minus 15 percent recruiting or hiring costs for mercenaries and a 15 percent morale for all mercenary units uh, while this can be quite good again it's just a one-time benefit from hiring mercenary units and pretty much you shouldn't really suffer in terms of hiring mercenary units so i don't see it as a lasting um, buff with the exception of course of the 15% morale which is quite good in the case of some mercenary units as some mercenary units typically tend to have lower morale so this could be quite helpful but again i would refrain from it uh, what i would recommend is getting the military conscriptor as you will need to replenish your armies faster in order to be able to keep your offensive rolling uh, next up we can also get the ferocious warrior that gives a uh, zeal and morale for units during offensive battle while this stat is not really all that important what it unlocks is absolutely important 
and once again we have an option that will improve our missile units and i'm not going to go for it because again we just have two to four missile units and i want to focus on buffs that can improve a vast majority if not the entirety of my army we can also select uh, a skilled ca cavalryman which gives a charge bonus for all cavalry units a nine melee attack skill for all cavalry units and a nine melee defense skill for all cavalry units once again i'm going to refrain for now we might you know turn back and try to get this if we have some points to spare but once again considering we only have four cavalry unit with a maximum possible of six for sparta we're going to ignore this skill Next up we have the trained swordsman and now this gives a 9 melee attack for all infantry units and 9 melee defense skill for all infantry units. Definitely get this as Sparta as you have seen. We pretty much have a 14 um, melee infantry units, melee as well as of course spearmen, phalanxmen, your general himself is of course considered a infantry unit. So definitely get this skill as it is affecting at least 70% of your army. Next up, we can have a look at the Commander of Men. Now, this is also a very good tree to go down. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we go here, I have forgotten the Drill Master. Now, with the Drill Master, we get ex increased experience gain per turn, which is quite good. The plus six movement speed for all units is also very good. However, the 9% attack for levy units and 9% increased defense for levy units, as I mentioned before, um is not uh, we don't have that many levy units as sparta and even our levy units are pretty horrible helot units so definitely you don't want to keep improving your levy units and if you even consider the the helot class as your levy units the only two uh, helots that i would recommend are your near the modes hoplite or your helot hoplites or your near the modes phalangite or your freed uh, you know freed helot pikemen and in the case of the hoplite, they are considered a levy unit, but for some reason the pikemen aren't. So this right here, the drill master won't really even impact your pikemen. And pretty much you will be using the near demores hoplite only in the early game. So it's not worth getting a skill that will only last you 40 turns at most. Um, so definitely avoid the skill unless you want that extra movement speed for your cavalry units that can be quite helpful as having an extra movement speed is quite crucial as you have seen uh, during battle i have mentioned that it's all about being decisive and quickly so time is of the essence and therefore movement speed is actually quite a powerful thing to have as uh, if you stack it up your hoplites can move at about three movement speed as opposed to two which is quite a significant increment However, that being said and done, let's move on to the next, which is the Commander of Men. You definitely want to get this uh, because it unlocks uh, several other abilities, such as the Booming Voice, which gives a 9% movement speed, which is, of course, better than the 6% that you get over here. However, the 6% does come with some other bonuses, such as the 10% experience uh, or 10 unit experience gain per turn, which can be quite helpful. Uh, next up you have the dread commander now this is quite good because it applies a minus 15 morale for all enemy units now previously i used to not get this so i am changing the meta a little bit because i have had a word with q sortorius and initially he had told me that it was very iffy that this would not apply in all circumstances however uh, now it does apply so long as you don't stack more than two moral uh, morale debuffs in your army the dread commander will stack uh, with the other morale debuff so you just want to maximize at two morale debuffs and of course with that we can go ahead and get the dread commander i would highly recommend for you to do so next up we just have uh, the sworn bodyguards that kind of improves your commander's abilities and again i'm going to say do not do not take skills that improve just a minor section of your army and improving your commander's ability is possibly the worst thing you can do because it just improves not even 10% of your army just about 5% of your army if you are playing with 20 units per army if you're playing with a 41 unit stacks that number drops by half a point um, about 2% of your entire army so yeah you're not going to notice that so 
Um, we also have the Proven Leader, which gives a 9 morale for all units during battles in foreign territories, as well as 15% campaign movement speed. Now, this is similar to the Master of Scouts in terms of campaign movement speed, which can be quite helpful. However, it does give the uh, increased ability to inspire, so I kind of recommend getting this. Um, we could take a look at the Skill Tactician Tree. And uh, with the skill tactician tree, you pretty much have a lot of like ambush uh, stuff, night battles and so forth. So I wouldn't really recommend it unless you're new to the game. Night battles can be quite easy, uh, you know, to make the game easier for you. However, you know, night battles were rarely fought and night battles were more like ambushes. So if you are using night battles for a pitched battle, then, uh, you know, it's not very historical. However, we do have now three skills remaining and we have to make the choice. So definitely as far as the yellow tree over here is concerned, we are not going to select anything from it because it's not really that helpful to us. The 15 campaign movement is still up for grabs. But what we have left is we have um, we have the options over here which can improve our cavalry. Keep in mind cavalry being at 4 units guaranteed per army is at 20% of the army. So that's still quite acceptable. And also cavalry is all about being decisive and can be the decisive wing and in most circumstances are the decisive wing of your battle. So improving them is definitely a good idea as opposed to let's say archer units or missile units that don't really have a significant impact. I mean to say that they don't have a significant impact would be wrong but they don't have their impact that can turn the tide of the battle. So definitely we could get this. And then we have two options, one that could increase our campaign movement and the other that could increase our movement speed for the unit itself. So what I would recommend is actually to get the one that improves your cavalry, for sure. Get the increased uh, campaign movement from here. And now between the two, it really is up to you. That will give the increased movement speed. You have nine movement speed, which is a lot better than six. Uh, however, you do get experience over here, gain per turn, but you do get second wind ability as well. And over here, you get the rally and inspire ability. Now, I really wish there was a tooltip to explain what these abilities do. And I might create a guide to explain it because I myself need to dive into the details of it. However, I would uh, typically go for the experience gain per turn because the experience gain per turn also applies to all units within your army. And should in case any of the AOR and mercenary units you hire uh, use the levy entry, then they are also going to benefit from the drill master. So pretty much this is kind of the build that I would recommend for Sparta. However, that being said and done for the general, we are going to move into the army traditions. And now with the army traditions, I can't really show uh, comparatively as to how and what path to go with however you're gonna have to trust my better judgment in this regard and what i do recommend is getting the strategic spear uh, avoiding completely the wall breacher line of things get instead the polis defenders now among these strategic spheres uh, once again you don't want to get the accomplice skirmishers because it is buffing just a minority of your army. Instead, what you want is the Formidable Spearman. And under the Formidable Spearman, you unlock the Legendary Spartan Hoplite. So let's go ahead, get all of them, and we can go ahead, select all of them. Now these uh, kind of give you really good stats for your melee spear units. And as you will see with Sparta, that is a recurring theme. You get a lot of buffs to complement your spear units because Sparta, while an infantry faction, focus mainly on spears and not sword infantry. Uh, now that we have unlocked the Polish defenders, we get access to three options. The Frontier Garrison, which gives an increased campaign movement, as well as the Keepers of the Peace and the Stalwart City defenders. Now, uh, personally, I would go ahead and get all three of them and I will explain why shortly. Um... So we have gotten ahead and selected all three of them. With the Frontier Garrison, we get extra campaign movement, which is quite good. As you can see, now our general has a, has lost some campaign movement. But that is just the way the game shows it on this turn. What it actually means is this is the amount we have actually increased our campaign movement by. And that's by stacking the Frontier Garrison with, of course, the Proven Leader. 
So definitely uh, you are looking at about a 33% movement increment. That's quite good. Next up, getting the keepers of the piece uh, while it gives six morale for units in foreign or allied, uh, sorry, in own or allied territory and nine percent pub, uh, nine public order, which isn't all that great, but it is quite useful when you are on the offensive to quickly, uh, you know, establish your public order in the newly conquered region. But what the keepers of the peace actually unlocks is the mercenary host. Now the mercenary host only affects mercenary units in your army and keeping in mind that 50% of your army is going to be composed of mercenary units, this is absolutely worth taking it. Uh, meanwhile with the stalwart defenders it might not be, it might not seem wise to do it so and get a minus 12 attritional losses when under siege. It's pretty much you have to be a complete idiot to be with an army that's under siege into a settlement I guess. Uh, or and it also gives 12 percent morale for all units in battle in own and allied territory which again it's not a big deal but what the stalwart city defenders does unlock is the peers of leonidas which gives a further upkeep cost reduction and a nine percent melee defense skill for all units so that is pretty powerful now once we have gotten that the last remaining skill we are going to get is of course the veteran hoplites which is the special skill available to any faction once they reach the army rank of six and this skill over here gives you plus three melee attack units for all hellenic infantry plus three melee defense skill for all hellenic infantry and of course at the maximum it gives you plus nine so this again, like uh, your mercenary host, will only improve half of your army, but that's still quite a lot. And so with that, I am quite comfortable with the army traditions for Sparta. And this is kind of like the army traditions you should be aiming for. And if you want to know an order in which you should aim for, I would recommend getting, um, you know, the Stratego Spears, the Formidable Spearmen, the Legendary Hoplites as soon as you can. Followed by, of course, the Polis Defenders. Um, you want to get the stalwart city defenders so that you unlock the peers of Leonidas which gives you an increased or decreased army upkeep and then you want to go down the keepers of peace to get that mercenary host as well as the veteran hoplites hopefully at the same time and together this these two uh, army traditions improve the melee attack and the melee defense of your entire army by nine percent and finally, you can get the Frontier Garrison that improves your campaign map movement range, which is quite useful in the late game when you have a massive empire and you need to get armies quickly across your empire. However, with that being said and done, I think we are done with the army guide for the Spartan faction and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I thank you all for watching. Hope you all enjoyed the video. And if you liked the video, then like the video. And don't forget to subscribe if you are interested for more. Peace and love.